This was a part of Boston in the 1870s, the age of Longfellow and Emerson and Lowell, of hoop skirts and bustles, of gallantry and sideburns and most fastidious manners known as genteel. Telegraph, just reaching our furthermost boundaries, was a common tool in Boston, the most familiar forerunner of the electric age. But still, this was the gaslight era. about the speed of light and the speed of sound? Much faster, much faster. Well, light is so fast that we see the lightning almost exactly when it happens. But um, what about the noise it makes, the uh, thunder? That's a lot slower. That's right. Thunder, the sound of lightning, comes to us at about a thousand feet a second. So with a little arithmetic, you can tell from that how far away the lightning is. You know how? We'd just as soon not know how close it is, eh, Sonny? <laughs> How can we tell? As simple as one, two, three. When the lightning flashes, count the seconds until the thunder comes. A second equals a thousand feet. There. One, two, three, four. Here. Four seconds away, so... Four times one thousand. Good. So the lightning was... 4,000 feet away from me. <laughs> Pretty close, that. Very close. Thunderation. Too dagnab close for your sincerely Willis J. Walton. <laughs> that was a real rip snorter. I guess there's one advantage to being deep like those dummies over there. They haven't been scared. Just look at them pattering away. There are no advantages I can think of to being deaf. There is a special disadvantage, I should say, in being deaf to warnings of danger. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Better be dumb than deep is what I say. But I guess they go together, right? Wrong. What did you say? I took leave to differ with you. I said wrong. I couldn't hear you. It looked like you said wrong. That's what I did say. I said wrong, and you read my lips. I can't read lips. Nobody can. And when you're deaf, you're dumb. My dear sir, the organs of speech are in no way affected by deafness. The deaf person is mute simply because he cannot hear and hasn't been taught to speak. A contradiction in terms, sir. A most illogical contradiction. The deaf mute speech organs may be intact, agreed. But if he can't hear a word, how? How in the name of all that's sensible is he, an idiot, going to learn to say it? Mr. Walton, my hearing must be failing me. I could have sworn you used the word idiot. I did. And in many states, the law classifies them as idiots. And that's practical. No speech, no language. And you can't think without language. And you can't undo the work of the Almighty. The Almighty is far more merciful to the deaf child than we, Mr. Walton. Than we? What do you mean? Nature inflicted upon the deaf child but one flaw. One little flaw, imperfect hearing. But we deny him speech by not teaching him to speak. And language by not teaching him to read. Sentimental balderdash. Monumental poppycock. Good afternoon, Mr. Walton. Goodbye. Goodbye, you arithmetic scholar. He can't hear you, Mr. Walton. I never hear you. He's deaf. He's born deaf. Well, for goodness sakes. Who was that with the deep boy? Him? Bell's the name. Professor Alexander Graham Bell. Young poor professor, but they say he comes from a family of teachers and writers. Yes, he got started early. A Scottish family, the Bells. They settled in Bradford, Canada. They teach people to talk, to talk clearly. 
all kinds of people, stuttering folks, children, and important people too, ministers and judges and political leaders. This young Bell's father, it said in the paper, publishes many books that go by thousands all over the world, even to China. Can you imagine teaching people to say their words just right? Bell now, he lectures at the university and he teaches the deaf to speak with some kind of system his father invented. The deaf can't hear, but there's a deaf young lady here in Boston they say can understand speech very well. That's Miss Mabel Hubbard, daughter of Gardner Green Hubbard. You've heard of Gardner Hubbard, lawyer and street railway man. One of our great families, the Hubbards. Well, they say the way this Miss Hubbard can talk and understand is a wonder. I guess she understands young Professor Bell all right. If all those endearing young charms Which I gave them so fondly today Were to change by tomorrow And please in my arms Like Sir. Did you know that if we had two pianos here and I struck this G, the G of the second instrument would sound? I suppose that second hypothetical piano could be made to play sympathetically the whole of endearing young charm. Mm. Mabel, darling, I'm going to say a few serious words to this young man. Do you want to stay? I shall do some plain talking. Hey, Father. Very well, you stay. Now, Mr. Bell, you listen to me. We've gone into business together, you and I. Yes? When you outlined your idea of finding a way to send several Morse telegraph messages at the same time over one wire, we arranged, without formalities, without contracts, for me to enter into your plans as a partner. Do you remember that? Of course I remember. You and Mr. Sanders were to supply the cost of the experiment. You want an accountant? I certainly do. Father. You are squandering, or at least mismanaging, the only essential asset we have in this enterprise. Do you know what that is? I quite fail to follow. If you think for a moment... Keep your seat, Mr. Bell. The only thing we can't get on without is you. Now, I haven't had detectives following you. It just happens quite by chance, by chance meetings with various acquaintances of mine and admirers of yours around Boston today, that I'm able to follow your activities in some detail. At nine o'clock, you are lecturing at Boston University. The power of this apparatus, gentlemen, is to me almost the unsurpassed marvel of nature. This is a formidable piece of machinery, even in the ear of the baby. And yet, the buzz of the gnat a dried leaf tumbled in the wind has the power to move it, to make a telegraph to the brain. By 11 o'clock, you had reached the Fuller School. The school has three good teachers now, but you stayed there for three hours and had nothing to eat but cake. How you reached the normal school by three o'clock, only you know. But there you were, starting a new class of prospective teachers for the deaf. I presume you've been in the laboratory since then. Oh, yes. Yes, sir, and I must tell Mr. you... Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell, these are all highly praiseworthy activities. I wouldn't have you drop them forever, but you've gone into business. I realize that, Gone into business with Tom Sanders and me to develop this new harmonic telegraph, a highly commercial and probably enriching enterprise. Remember, it seems to me that if you gave your full attention to the telegraph, you'd soon have time and funds for other things and for work on that obsession of yours, the transmission of speech by telegraph wire. Oh, yes, I sir. just hope for all of our sakes that you slow down before you break. 
I realize that, sir. Please forgive me. I am not well organized, but I came here to tell you something. Something amazing. Beyond anything we've foreseen. Uh, this, this is a reed, Mabel. This simple little thing. We tune them, you see. Two of them tuned to the same pitch will vibrate together when electric current is applied to them. Well, presumably, reeds differently tuned on the same line will not react. He means all reeds will be silent unless they receive impulses from instruments tuned to them. Exactly. And the same wire, we hope, may be used for many telegraph messages at one time. Now, Tom Watson and I were preparing for a test. I was adjusting this reed, this very reed, in this manner. Watson was in another room operating the transmitting reed when, when I heard something. It was like nothing ever heard before. Yes, Alice. I uh, ran to Watson and said, what happened? What did you do? What had he done? This. Just this. Hear it? A slight twang, Mabel. A piece of metal vibrating. And so, Mr. Bell, what was the wonderful thing that you heard? This same sound. Diminish the murmur of it. This. Really, Alec. Don't you see? Tell us, Alec. A sound was transmitted. Not a signal, not the clack of a telegraph. This little thing moving over this coil had generated an infinitesimal current, varying, modulated like speech. It came from Watson over there to my reed over here. It duplicated exactly the sound over there in this reed in my hand. So simple. I must say I'm still at sea. If Watson's voice had vibrated his reed, I should have heard Watson's voice on my reed. But you didn't hear it. How could you? Well, by using a parchment diaphragm, sir. A diaphragm attached to the reed. By a diaphragm, very like the top of this hat. You'll try it, I suppose? Of course. Tonight, in an hour. Watson has been working on it all day. All ship shape, Mr. Watson? All ready, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, Tom? Yes, sir. I should say something rather special. What if I can? Well, go to your post, my friend, and listen. Yes. Listen well. And let us pray that Comet may, that Comet will for our last. Man to man, the world o'er shall brothers be. Father. Well, Mr. Watson, I, I heard your voice. I'm, I'm sure it was your voice. I couldn't make out the words. I couldn't just catch them. Now, everyone may not know that this first telephone was scientifically correct in principle, and that the original instrument has worked many times since under more favorable conditions. Bell himself couldn't know this at the time. So months of tireless study and rebuilding, endless testing went by. Months went by and winter came before the telephone performed a characteristic service with its first intelligible sentence. Every word you 
Ramsey, you were perfectly clear. I, I, I recognized your voice. You said, Mr. Watson, come, come here. here. I want, I want you. you. <laughs> 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 you well, Mr. Watson, I did want you. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how it happened. The telephone was a fact. But for all the acclaim of science, Bell still faced a skeptical business world that had to be shown the practical uses of the telephone. So he must perforce barnstorm with this great instrument of communication, hide his impatience, prove the obvious. He must have the good Watson serenade across the Hudson to the doubting Thomases of finance. From New Brunswick, New Jersey to New York, Watson serenaded the curious. I am the invisible Tom Watson. Everybody hears me. Nobody sees me. Ahoy! Ahoy, Mr. Watson. Will you oblige us with a song? <clears throat> all right, all right. <clears throat> in some haste to invent the telephone, for it has urgent work to do. Talk, sing, makes you laugh. Quite an entertainment, yes. But I want to see it buckle down and work. In my view of the future, the novelty will wear off. The instrument will be refined. It will grow light, convenient, and familiar to every hand. A common tool within the means of every factory, business, every home. And connected to a central switching office which can connect any two subscribers in a matter of seconds. And then I see its lines and poles marching thousands of miles. Connecting the head office of every city in the land to the head office of every other city. And then I see, perhaps in the next century, the tiniest father's hamlet woven into the wire fabric. Doctors summoned. Disasters met and overcome. So that was Bill in 1876. When I was your age starting in here at the laboratory, that's what impressed me most about, Bell. Having done this great thing right at the start. <laughs> I used to say that's the way I'll handle my career. However, now that the boy has grown older, you know, I get the same inspiration from the way he had carried on. In all directions. The variety of the man's thinking. At 37, take a case. He developed with two associates the wax phonograph record, financed it with an award from France for telephonic achievement. And all the earnings of the phonograph record patent went to founding the association to aid the deaf. He initiated and extended the National Geographic Society's magazine. Reaches a lot of people now. 
And then the airplane. When Bell met Len Curtis and other aviation pioneers, it was much as your life was worth to back heavier than aircraft. But from that meeting of minds, the association then formed, came new ways of controlling flight. But he never forgot the death. He spent six years without compensation, taking a national census of death. And it all ties together somehow, widening horizons for the deaf, widening horizons of the mind, communication, transportation. Yes, you're lucky to be hearing him today. Lucky. He's 74 now. Young gentlemen, it uh, was suggested when I was invited here that I speak to you, the laboratory's newest, youngest engineer, about the telephone. But to tell you the truth, I am sure that in your technical training, you have learned more about the telephone than I ever shall know. Thousands of patents and procedures and devices have been added since last I concerned myself with it. And uh, I must confess that I haven't kept track. The telephone system today is a blend of thousands of minds and ideas. The first telephone also was a blend of many minds. No invention really can belong to one mind alone. Realize, gentlemen, there are no soloists, no prima donnas in science or engineering. One cannot learn enough alone. And I think it is this interdependence and the realization of it that tends to make science virtuous and not evil, harmonious and not discordant. Sometimes a junior scientist has fixed me with a jaundiced eye and charged, your generation has done it all. Everything is invented, finished. To this I say, I say it to you, as long as man suffers and wants and wonders, science's work is hardly begun. No doubt some young scientist at this moment is dreaming a dream or writing an equation which within your lifetime will tap some source of universal power and dwarf all our engines and dynamos. What should you work upon in the laboratory of the shop? Well, my ideas are limited. Such as they are, I do not hoard them. I take the liberty of offering a few examples. Years ago, using a substance whose resistance changes according to the light that falls upon it, I managed to telephone for a short distance without wires along a beam of sunlight. And perhaps there is for you to find a way to make the light that passes through motion picture film reproduce the voice with clarity and range. Further, I suggest that disasters such as the Titanic encountered in the North Atlantic are unnecessary. There is a means, if you can but find it, of utilizing the echo principle, so that a ship's bridge may see or feel or hear an iceberg in time to change a ship's course. Now, 
I give you one of my failures to punish. It has been very dear to me throughout my life. Before the telephone, I tried to build a device to record the human voice in visual and readable symbols. This, if you succeed, can have several practical applications. The immediate one will immeasurably benefit the deaf. You will understand why this means so much to me. By profession, by personal wish and instinct, I have always been a teacher of the deaf. This, then, is an assignment from me to you. A rather special thing in the greater picture of science. But, young gentlemen, I toss you that brand with this final word. Do not neglect those obscure corners where men work to discover the unknown, to prove the intangible. For here is dawn coming up. Here is tomorrow. scientific minds working together in many places have since brought forth much that Bell's prophetic vision foresaw. The motion picture was given a voice. Radio and television were perfected. Life-saving mechanisms of sonar and radar were designed. They have succeeded too, as he hoped they would, in turning spoken words into visible symbols that deaf children can learn to read as the words are spoken. In the laboratories that now bear his name, Bell's scientific heirs have taken a leading part over the years in the research that made all these things possible. Yet these are but eddies in the main channel of telephone research, as step by step we move toward the realization of Bell's early dream his dream of a day when anyone, anywhere, can talk clearly and at a moment's notice with anyone, anywhere else. And let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that, that man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for all that.